A pastor explained to his church that it was in need of some extra money. So he asked them to prayerfully consider being more than generous in their next several offerings. To motivate them, and I don't approve of this, this particular pastor offered that whoever gave the most would be able to pick three hymns. On that Sunday, the offering plates were passed about the church. Then they were placed there at the front before the pastor. The pastor happened to glance down, and he noticed someone had graciously placed a $100 bill in one of the plates. He was so excited, he began to immediately share his joy with the congregation. And he said, again, I don't approve of this. He said, I'd like to personally thank the person who placed the $100 bill on the plate. A very quiet, elderly, saintly lady in the back of the church shyly raised her hand. The pastor, with a wide, cheery grin, invited her to come to the front. So she slowly made her way towards him. The pastor told her, in front of all who had assembled, how wonderful it was that she had given so generously. And as a token of his gratitude, again, I don't approve of this, <laughs> he asked her to pick out three hymns. Her eyes brightened, and she looked over the congregation with what could only be described as youthful vigor. She pointed to the three most handsome men in the church and said, I'll take him, and him, and him. <laughs> Write it down in the annals. I used humor today. <laughs> Generosity is defined as a readiness or liberality in giving. Generosity is a readiness or a willingness to give. It is also described with this synonym, open-handedness. Do you get the visual? As opposed to being tight-fisted, having a closed hand concerning your possessions, open-handedness. In the Greco-Roman world of Luke's day, reciprocity was expected amongst friends who were social equals. Now, you need to know this. One was expected. This was virtuous to be generous towards one's friends within the same social structure, understanding they would be obligated to reciprocate or return the favor to you at a future day. We have expressions that portray this Greco-Roman mindset. Perhaps you've heard it before. I scratch your back. You scratch my back. Being generous toward those of lower social statuses, those beneath you, those who could not, even if they desired, return the favor, that type of generosity was rare, even despised. The Greco-Roman generosity was a generosity based on the principle of reciprocity. As we work through our text, Luke 4, 32 through 37, 
we'll discover that the early church was marked by not a Greco-Roman generosity. Rather, the early church was marked by a true generosity. I define a true generosity as this, a generosity without the primary thought of human reciprocity. I'm not in any way denying that Christian generosity doesn't have one eye towards the generous and reciprocating hand of God. Right? Remember what Jesus said? Give, and it'll be given to you. That fuels our giving. But what I'm saying is this, true generosity, Christian generosity, Trinitarian generosity, is a generosity without the primary thought of human reciprocity. My aim this morning is clear and simple. I will seek to demonstrate to you how true generosity, which I will state is Trinitarian generosity, is being worked into the hearts of all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want you to walk out thinking about. As you grow to understand true generosity, as you see it as being trinitarianly rooted, I want you, believer in Jesus Christ, to walk out encouraged that God is, it's not that he might, it's not that we hope, he is and will be working to cultivate in you this true generosity. This open-handedness, this charity that does not primarily think about human reciprocity. Here's how I'm going to go about my aim. First, I'm going to demonstrate to you how the early church was marked by true generosity. I feel like I've got to prove that from the text of Scripture. So that's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to look and see, is it really true that this early church was marked by true generosity? Then secondly, I will seek to defend the idea or claim that true generosity is Trinitarian generosity. I'm going to have to defend that. Right now, that should seem very ethereal. It's kind of a high thought. We've got to bring that down and make it plain that even the youngest amongst us could understand that true generosity is rooted in the triune God and his generosity towards us. And then finally, I'll remind you that true generosity, this Trinitarian generosity, is and will be worked into the hearts of all who believe, for which each of us ought to be able to say a hearty praise God. So first, let me demonstrate to you that the early church was marked by true generosity. Let me demonstrate that to you from our text. I believe there are three evidences that the early church was marked by true generosity. Three evidences grounded in this scripture that we're considering today. Number one, I want to point your minds to consider the textual evidence. Did you all bring your Bibles with you today? I hope so. I want you to see from the text itself evidence that reminds us this was an impressive generosity that characterized the early church. So look with me at the textual evidence as it's deposited in verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Notice carefully the description here. The full number, the entire assembly, the entire congregation. We have learned previously in Acts that we can estimate safely this is a congregation of around 15 up to 25,000. You try to get 15 to 25,000 people united in mind and heart on anything. And I'm going to walk away impressed. And Luke says, 
the full number of those who believe. So he's not describing a generic assembly. He's describing a very specific covenant community. The believing ones. And it's not just a fuzzy believing. The ones who have repented of their sin and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The ones who have then identified with Christ through baptism. The ones who have dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. That community, the entire community, was of one mind and heart. The heart, biblically speaking, points to the mind, thought process, convictions. The soul, in contrast to the heart, points towards feelings, emotional trajectories, one's attitude towards some person or some thing or some idea. And our text is telling us that this community, they're all on the same page. That's impressive. But look a little bit further at the textual evidence. Keep reading. And if you could, say the next two words with me. No one. Now again, wouldn't you be impressed if it said this? 95%. But Luke is making a very bold claim. The full number. That doesn't leave any room for outliers. And then he says, no one. Again, where's the exception? It's not there. No one, now look at this next, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. Now this is not the renouncement of private property. Because Luke affirms things that belonged to them. What we find here is something different. It's not common ownership. It's a common sharing of what one owned. No one said, to quote the high-minded film, Finding Nemo, and the wise seagulls who speak throughout the film. Mine, 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 mine. No one said, look at this, no one said, mine. Everyone said, ours. This is impressive. Let's look further at the textual evidence. Back to verse 32. But they had everything in common. This is a practice of mutual support. This is the common use of possessions. This assembly, 15,000 up to 25,000 strong, acted like the ideal family. Some of you know, I live in the same neighborhood as my dad. Half his tools are located where? I don't know how this happens. I believe, this is my theory, I've tried to sell him on it. The tools actually grow legs, and during the nighttime, they raise the garage door, they walk a couple blocks, and then they park themselves in my garage or shed. But you know what's awesome? You know what's awesome? It's one of the things I love about my dad. He doesn't get mad about me having them, right? right? You can expect and understand, and I agree with him, frustrated that I don't return it to the place from which I took it? Sure, sure, sure. But as they say in our Spanish-speaking cultures, in our family, Mikasa, 
Sukasa. Isn't it awesome for anyone that knows this? Because I know this and I praise God for it. Isn't it awesome to be a part of a loving family? There are three evidences of the early church being marked by true generosity. First, there is textual evidence. We've seen that in verse 32. Secondly, there is historical evidence. Historical evidence. Now, nerds, pay close attention. Non-nerds, get a power nap. I'll wake you up in a moment. There was a community that existed at this time in ancient Israel. Historical Jesus scholars label this as a counter-temple community. And they put it in the same category as the early church. Both are being described as counter-temple movements. Movements where people, due to the lack of faith, corruption, and apostasy of Israel's leadership, communities who, form, who formed, who claimed that they were the true eschatological Israel. They were the community in which you would find God at work and operating. This particular community is called the Essene community. The Essene community, E-S-S-E-N-E. -S -E -E. Now they were located in Qumran on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea. If you wanted to join the Essene community, here's what you would have to agree to. You would, A, physically move to Qumran, and there you renounced all private property, and you submitted your assets to a common fund. Now, this isn't that strange. We've all heard of communes or communal living, even in our day. Some of you might be old enough, part of that hippie generation. You were once attracted by that thought. In the Essene community, you renounce private property, they established a common fund, and then everyone would be receiving an equal distribution established by the Essene leadership. Each member received a common share. To live in the Essene community, you had to obey this man-made law. In the Essene community, you gave by compulsion. You don't agree to this? Hit the door. You're out. Hear me carefully. The early church was not a socialistic commune. Listen carefully to these distinguishing features as we contrast the Essenes and the early church. Listen to this comparison. In the early church, the generosity was voluntary. It was not compelled by a law. In the early church, they distributed according to needs that arose. There was no common share equal disbursements given to everyone who was part of the community, connected or not connected to need? No. In the early church, they maintained ownership of private property. We will find Mary in Acts chapter 12 still owning a house and even employing a servant. They didn't release their property. They practiced common use of possessions. I hope I'm making it clear. The early church was like a loving family. That's evidence number two. We've got textual evidence of the generosity of the early church. We've got historical evidence as we compare the early church and how they operated to another counter-temple movement, the Essenes, located in Qumran. And then here's the third line of evidence. I now zoom out of our immediate text, and I want you to consider a theme developed in the book of Acts. 
Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47. Guess what Luke highlights? The generosity of the early church. And then there's our text, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. And then we'll get to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and we'll find what? More generosity of the early church. The meeting of needs of both the Jewish and Grecian widows. And then it won't be much longer to Acts chapter 11. In Antioch, a prophet stands up and prophesies of a famine that's going to come to Jerusalem and rock the economy there. And what does the church do in Antioch? They prayerfully and individually, in accordance to the Spirit's leading, they give so that Paul and Barnabas can take a financial gift to aid the poor saints in Jerusalem. So here's what's happening. All throughout the book of Acts were being brought back to this theme. The early church didn't pursue generosity. The early church exuded generosity. So we've seen how Luke portrays the early church as being marked by true generosity. Now let's turn our attention within our text to showing, and this is the harder thing to do, let's show how true generosity is Trinitarian generosity. How is true generosity Trinitarian generosity? Now, let me pause here and just explain what I'm meaning. How is this generosity that we've identified that marked the early church, how is it to be credited to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Church, let me remind you, we are Trinitarians. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. We believe in one God. We believe that one God exists in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'm making the argument this morning that even in Luke's text, the way that he writes it, we see breadcrumbs that lead us to the Father's hand as being the source of this generosity. We see another breadcrumb trail that if we'll follow it, Hansel, Gretel's, will lead us to the hand of the sun as the source of this generosity. And we'll see another trail that leads us to contemplate how the Spirit works to produce this generosity in the hearts of His covenant community. Now by this statement, true generosity is Trinitarian generosity. In fact, let's just pause for a moment And can you, like mindless robots, repeat that phrase with me? True generosity is Trinitarian generosity. Let's try that again. True generosity is Trinitarian generosity. Thank you. Next time, color it with a little bit of feeling. (laughs) By this statement, I mean two things. First, this true generosity is seen in the actions of the Trinity. Do you understand that? True generosity, what's displayed all throughout the book of Acts, is actually seen in the activity of our triune God. And a child says, prove it. John 3.16. For God so, say it with me, loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Where do you see a generosity without thought of reciprocity? What can you give to God? What does the infinite Creator God need from you? How much further below His social status can any of us come to? And yet, in the Trinity, we see generosity. We see an open-handedness to bless those of an infinitely lower social status who can give nothing back to Him. All our righteousness in His eyes is as what? 
filthy rags. Wow. Now watch this. I mean, two things. So first, I'm saying we see this type of generosity in the economy of the Trinity, but I'm also meaning this. This generosity is the work of the Trinity in the heart of this community. Now let me prove that. First, let me prove that Luke wants you to see the Spirit's hand at work. Everyone look at verse 31. Look at verse 31. This was not part of our public Scripture reading. This was part of last week's sermon from Brother Tapp. Look at verse 31. Follow along as I read. And when they had prayed, the place was place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were, say the next word with me, all. I'm reading out of the ESV. They were all filled. They were all filled with the Spirit. And then here's what you find. After that statement, that's a declarative statement. It's descriptive. It's the historical record. They prayed and the Spirit of God filled them. What you will find from that point on, remember, as this scripture was given, there were no verses or chapter divisions. What you'll find from that point on is the effect of the Spirit's filling. Did you hear that? It's the effect of the Spirit's filling. As the Spirit took control of this community, where did he steer them? Ladies, not to home goods. <laughs> not into that driveway with the garage sale that you just know has some gym waiting for you. No, the Holy Spirit didn't steer them there. The Holy Spirit steered them towards true Trinitarian generosity. Please hear this. And, and, and church, fellow elders, hold me accountable. May this always be the mindset that we have concerning the topic of generosity. May it also philosophically guide us. Luke is not giving Theophilus a pep talk about what the church should be. Rather, Luke is giving an accurate representation of what the church is and will be when it's filled by the Spirit. So do we need a Dave Ramsey course to grow generosity here in this church? If you think that's the problem, you should start working for the CDC. You'll find good company there. Misdiagnosing. If you think the problem is, preacher, you don't preach enough about biblical tithing. And it's true. I've probably from this pulpit preached less than five sermons in 12 years on biblical tithing. Preacher, the, the church I was a part of, like every February, right before we got our tax checks, there was a whole month dedicated towards financial stewardship. You look at the broader evangelical church, that's exactly what happens. Once a year, once a month, Sunday mornings, dedicated to fill the budget. You say, preacher, well, what do you believe philosophically is the means by which God will enable us to be the type of generous church we ought to be? There, there's one thing. There's one thing needed. One thing that you and I would pursue the filling of the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit is, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So when the Spirit is filling me, how will I feel towards my brother in need? I will feel towards them lovingly. The fruit of the Spirit is faith. So even though I may not see how I can give, because my giving will create my own need of replenishment, the Spirit fills me with faith to trust that my God will supply all my needs. The Spirit fills me 
with joy because I affirm the teaching of our Lord Jesus. The Spirit leads me to affirm it. It is better to give than to receive. Do you see the hand of the Spirit in their generosity? Do you see now why I'm making the claim true generosity is Trinitarian? It's the work of the Spirit. Therefore, if you lack a charitable heart, if you find yourself in the category of Ebenezer Scrooge or the rich young ruler laying up more treasure for yourself, heed the word of Luke 11. Pray to the Father and He will give you the Holy Spirit. Heed the word of Paul. Immerse yourself in the word of God. You'll find yourself increasingly filled by the Spirit. Listen to the letter Paul wrote to Corinth and remind yourself that the Spirit through the gospel of Jesus Christ has actually now tabernacled in your body. Honor Him. Do not quench Him or grieve Him. I want you to see, not only does Luke point us to seeing the generosity as being from the Spirit, Luke points us to see the generosity as the cross work of the Son. Now, just go back to the text. I'm not making this up. It's right there in the text. Notice what happens next. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony. It's the Greek word maturion, witness. They were giving their witness. That's a huge theme all throughout the book of Acts. The apostles in power are witnessing or preaching. And what are the, the apostles preaching? Here, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But I believe that it's safe for us to also understand that this specific focus, preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, is not to the exclusion of the death of the Lord Jesus, or the burial of the Lord Jesus, or the ascension of the Lord Jesus, or the exaltation of the Lord Jesus, or the soon coming return of the Lord Jesus. Here's what I want you to see. The Spirit moved the apostles to preach the gospel. And the gospel wasn't just for the unsaved that might walk into Solomon's portico. The gospel was the primary means of sanctification for the saints. Here's what I'm saying. Do you know what fueled the generosity of the early church? They kept hearing about Jesus, who being rich for our sake became poor so that we who were poor might be made rich in Him. When you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you hear what God did for Jesus, who willingly became poor, how He raised Him from the dead, and set Him at the Father's right hand, and has put all things under His feet, when you hear that, what effect does it have on you? If you couldn't tell, it makes you want to give. <laughs> Why do I bear this beautifully luscious beard? Because at some point, many moons ago, I saw someone else with this beard, and I says to myself, I says to myself, Karen didn't say this to me. <laughs> we just celebrated our 17th anniversary. I'm surprised I didn't get a razor. Karen didn't say this to me. Oh, you'd look good in a robust, God-honoring, Christ-like beard. She didn't say that to me. I saw a beard, a full, luscious, robust, apostolic, Reformation beard. I saw it on some good-looking man, and I says to myself, I think that's beautiful, and I wanted to become what I beheld is beautiful. And brothers and sisters, if we will keep coming back to the cross, if we will keep coming back 
to the glory of the gospel of what our Savior did. The Son of God, the true Isaac, who willingly crawled on the altar, i.e. cross. But no one needed to bind him. He surrendered his life for us. And when you behold the beauty of that generosity, when you gaze at it, when you meditate on it, when you pray that the Spirit of God would give you a growing ability to understand its depth and its breadth, and that it would not just be here in the head, but it would take over the heart. When, when that happens, you will find yourself becoming what you are beholding. Now, I've got to prove the point from Scripture. Look back at verse 33. Notice the conjunction. So they're preaching the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, commentators are divided. Some say that this is referencing the community there in Jerusalem looking on the early church with approval. Like they're just impressed by this radical generosity. They're impressed how this early church community takes care of its own. Some, some people are persuaded that they anchor that belief in comparison this text with Acts 2. I'm persuaded differently. I'm persuaded that there is a link here. That the conjunction shows us that the great grace, right? Great grace. Some translations put it this way. Much grace was upon them all. One of God's graces that he gifts to the church is the grace of giving. And I believe that Luke is giving us insight. How was this radical generosity produced and sustained. It wasn't just the hand of the Spirit. Remember, we're what? Say it with me. Trinitarians. It wasn't just the hand of the Spirit. It's the hand of the Spirit and the hand of the Son. The preaching of the cross work of Jesus fueled great grace. Fueled great Generosity fueled transformation. Listen to Daniel Peterson. He writes this in the Pillar Commentary series. It was the Spirit-empowered ministry of the Word that brought great grace on them all. But the remarkable point about this verse, Peterson says, is the implication that it was the powerful preaching of the gospel that motivated the earliest Christians to such generosity, not specifically preaching about money or exhortations from leaders to sell possessions. This is why I'd encourage you to turn off nearly all of Channel 40. The apostles didn't leverage people to give. The apostles didn't set up shop and do a 10-week series entitled, Open Thou Your Hands. The apostles preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who believed received the Spirit. The Spirit did His work, part of which was causing them to behold. The consequence of which is that they would then become. Do you struggle to give to the church? Do you struggle to give to missions? Do you struggle to give to your family? Do you struggle to give to the poor? I present to you the antidote of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, I want you to see how Luke points us to see the generosity. This generosity is the work of the Father. This is where we'll just see how far we get in this. This is good. Luke wants us to see this generosity is the work of the Father. Okay? We've done 32. We've done 33. Now let's go to verse 34 and 35. Verse 34. 
there was not, again, I'm looking at the ESV. If you can do this and you got an ESV, say the next five words with me. There was not together a needy person among them. Wow. It's not saying that everyone had the same bank account or possessions or amount of land or high wage earning job. It's not saying that. Here's what it's saying. Anyone who had a need within this covenant community did not remain poor. And here's the definition of poverty. I got a need and I have no capacity to meet it. Because God's blessing and abundance on others within the covenant community through the stirring of the Spirit of God and the cross work of Jesus Christ was utilized to meet that need. Therefore, the poor was no longer poor. Do you get that? Again, it's not that somehow they went from I have no home to now I have two homes. It's not that they went from I have a low wage earning job, I'm a servant, and now I'm a landholder with servants of my own. Where'd you get that? Join this church. No. It's, we needed medicine, and we couldn't pay for it. And we talked to the apostles. And because of the free will generosity of others, the apostles got us the medicine we needed. Yeah, we still don't make much money. And we still live in a 200 square foot apartment. But don't call us poor, because our needs have been met. Luke wants us to see, though, that this is from the Father. Now, now, y'all, I don't want you just to drink the Kool-Aid. I want you to be Bereans, and I want you to push back on me and say, okay, where in the world do you see distinctly the work of God the Father in verse 34 and 35. So let's read verse 34 and 35, and then let me defend my claim. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now don't misread this. Don't misread this as saying everyone who owned land liquidated all their land what would you do if the entire church liquidated all its land? You say, oh, wow, we'd have quite the fund to invest. Yes, but then from that very fund, we'd have to dole out payments so that we could all have a place to live. Are, are you there? Right, right. Uh, there, there, there is a form of foolish generosity where, where I'm giving to an extent of irresponsibility putting myself in a position of need and now dependence upon the generosity of others? Do you have a category for that in your head? You ought to. That was not the practice of this church. The practice was this. As people became aware of needs, as their heart was stirred for the advancement of the kingdom of God, as they realized how much God had blessed them, when they heard of a need and that they had the means to meet the need, they would do what the Spirit stirred them to do so that that need could be met. And they did so joyfully. Now, some of you who know where Luke's going in this text, he's setting up the two following stories. The story of Barnabas and the contrasting story of Ananias and Sapphira. Both individuals who had land and houses, who liquidated land and houses, but had very different very different ends, but I won't want to get too ahead of myself. Look at the, verse 35, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. And again, what I want you to be thinking about is, okay, how can you defend the statement that this is pointing us to the work of the Father? Seth, I think that you're being hermeneutically clever or homiletically clever, but I think you're going above the line of Scripture or below the line of Scripture, and brother, I admonish you to get back right in line with the Scripture. Hold on, hold on. Put the stone down. 
Could you turn to Deuteronomy 15? Deuteronomy 15. I want you to look at verse 4. Deuteronomy 15.4. And again, if you've got an ESV Bible, boy, it kind of seems like I'd like for you to have an ESV Bible. If you have an ESV Bible, I'd like for you to look at verse 4 and be ready to read when I point to you to read. There will be no... Say the next word with me. Poor. There will be no, again, poor among you. Here's what I'm claiming. Because I don't have time to do this. I could, though, in private. I could show you how Luke, the way that he writes, he's always pointing us back to prophetic fulfillment He's always, always helping us hear Old Testament echoes. In the Greek, in the Greek, the term that is translated poor is the term indeis. Indeis. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, which was likely the Bible of Jesus and the apostles, the Septuagint. In the Septuagint, Deuteronomy 15.4 says, there will be no indeis among you. Lean into this. You may have to climb, but lean into this and don't miss it. I have some carefully worded statements. The eternal plan of God the Father revealed in Scripture is that God the Father is making for Himself a people. It's the big plan of the Bible. God's making for himself a people. It'll be ruled by his son. It'll be filled by his spirit. But the father is making for himself a people. Those people, Scripture reveals, are to be marked by a radical love, a radical generosity, a radical open-handedness to meet the needs of the poor within their covenant community. In other words, those people that God is out to make are to be characterized by a primary love for Him that then overflows to an appropriate love for their brother or sister. This is the plan of the Father. This is the meta-narrative of Scripture. According to the prophets, in the last days, God would pour out His Spirit upon His people and they would obey His law from the heart. Israel envisioned a glorious in time eschatological future where God's plenteous blessing returned upon them as a covenant people and returned upon their land. A type of blessing that would fuel this radical generosity. Therefore, in the first century, even outside the church, there was a belief that eschatological Israel would be marked by no poverty. Do you understand now what the Essenes were trying to do? The Essenes were trying to, through self-effort, become the eschatological people of God. They were trying to do it through law. They were trying to pursue being in a state where God would be pleased with them. And then God would bring about the fulfillment of the ancient prophecies. We are not saved by works though. We are saved by grace. And so contrast the Essene community with the church community. What happened in the church? Read Acts 2. Read Acts 3. Read Acts 4. The Spirit of God was poured out. The Spirit of God tabernacled within the bodies of the early church community. The Spirit of God bore His fruit. The Spirit of God poured out in Acts 2 a wampum blessing. And that wampum blessing enabled the people to give to the extent that they are the fulfillment of what Deuteronomy 15 foresaw. There was no poor among them. 
Do you see the Father's hand? Do you see the Father's hand? I'm pointing to providence. I'm pointing to how God, for His glory, brings about this ultimate end slowly through recapitulation after recapitulation and escalation. Now, I have one last place, and then I'll close. One last place I want you to go. I want you to go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Are you ready to leave on a high note? Okay, okay. Two of you are. The rest of you, the rest of you, the rest of you in the flesh, I feel like I should dismiss you now. Okay? Psalm 110. This psalm, Psalm 110, was cited in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. And what Peter said in Acts chapter 2 is that what Psalm 110 prophesied has happened in the exaltation and enthronement of Jesus Christ. Peter said to those that had gathered there at Pentecost that God the Father has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. And he cites Psalm 110. So let's read verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, Yahweh says to David's Lord, David's greater son, Yahweh says to the son of David, Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That happened at the ascension and the enthronement of Christ. But look at verse 2. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, Rule in the midst of your enemies. I wonder, just thinking out loud, is that a veiled reference to the sending of the Spirit? Which happened upon the enthronement of the Son. Which is the means by which the kingdom is established. But then look at verse 3. You ought to write this down and put this on your fridge this week. You ought to put it on a 3 by 5 card and tape it to your dashboard and let this just preach to you all week long. Psalm 110, verse 3. Your people will offer themselves. Say the next word with me. Freely. When? On the day of your power. Okay, what's the psalmist describing? What's the psalmist describing? The psalmist is saying this, that when the Messiah takes his place, after crushing the serpent, dying and rising again, when that lamb who's now a lion, slain before the foundation of the world, steps out from the multitude of heavenly witnesses, Revelation chapter 5, steps forward to receive what is rightfully his, all authority and power. When the people of God behold their resurrected and exalted and enthroned Messiah, how will the people of God respond? The people of God, through the Spirit, will be so moved. They'll live out Romans 12, 1 and 2. The people of God will be so moved by the Spirit and the work of the Son, the plan of the Father coming to fruition. The people of God will offer themselves. You can't give more than yourself. The people of God will offer themselves, not curmudgingly, not as a result of manipulation, not as a result of legalism. The people will offer themselves willingly when on the day of his enthronement. So is it any wonder that in Acts 2, after Pentecost, from verse 42 and 47, what does Paul describe? the radical generosity of the early church community. And too many times we hear that preached as a template. The early church was generous, therefore you ought to be generous. Do you understand how we're missing the mark? Do you understand what Luke is saying? Luke is shouting to Theophilus as loudly as he can, understand the times. Behold what God the Father has done. God the Father has sent his Son The suffering servant has died and risen. He will now make many people righteous. The nations are his. He's seated. He's enthroned. And his people, as they are brought to himself, in response to his work on the cross, 
and his future work in the building of his kingdom and his soon coming return, his people will respond by offering themselves willingly on the day of his power. So you see it in Acts 2. And then you see it again in Acts 4. And then you see it again in Acts 6. And you see it again in Acts 11. And you'd think we'd start listening that the last days have come. There is a new Israel. It is those who through repentance and faith have yielded themselves to the Lordship of God's Son. They are the fulfillment of all that the prophets foresaw. I challenge you when you go home today, read Revelation 5. When the lamb slain steps out to take the scroll, what happens in that heavenly throne room? I want you to read Revelation 5 with Psalm 110.3 in mind. The saints that surround the throne fall down and they offer themselves freely. How many of you have ever heard that concept of we're going to cast our crowns before his feet? How many of you have ever heard that concept? But did you know it's a fulfillment of Psalm 110.3? Did you know that that's the all-glorious plan of the Father? Is there anyone like our Father? No. I say, in true conclusion, true generosity, Trinitarian generosity, is being worked into the hearts of all who believe. It is, it is and it will be. Uh, my textual proof for that is the repetitive pattern found in the book of Acts. My textual proof of that is Philippians 1.6. He who begins a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. My admonition to you, saints, is let's walk in confidence and not frustrate the grace of God. He is at work in you to take those closed hands and open them up that they might mirror the hands of our triune God. Let's pray. Father, help us now. Help us now. Lord, I pray even as I close in prayer, those that need to repent would repent. Repent of their building bigger barns. Repent of their excessive laying up in store. Repent of their hard-heartedness towards the needs of the global church and the needs of the local church. I pray that they would repent at a deeper level. Their unwillingness to behold the beauty of the Lamb who was slain, who, though he was rich, for our sakes became poor. I pray that they would repent of how they have grieved and quenched the Spirit. Lord, I repent of all those things. Father, fill us with faith. If it's true, that to the Philippian church you promised, a church that gave out of the abundance of their poverty. What an ironic statement. If you said to that church that you would supply all their need, and the context there is they've sacrificially given and you're now not going to let them go without, how much more will you supply our needs? as we open our hands. God, my specific prayer is this. No one will have true generosity until they come in right relationship with the triune God. So, Father, I pray that there would be young adults 
whose eyes are opened right now. I, I pray that there would be aged ones whose hearts are regenerated right now. Lord, we're not the Essenes, and we're not going to try to be like it. You can't fake this till you make this. We love you because you first loved us. So, Father, we wait on you. We wait on you. Apart from you, we can do nothing. Lord, may we joyfully, this afternoon and all throughout the week to come, contemplate the depth and breadth and height of your love for us. May we be the embodiment of Trinitarian generosity in the days to come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.